This is Gloucester Railway Station, rebuilt two years ago at a cost of half a million dollars. Today, it's virtually deserted. Under the state government's rationalisation of rail services, Gloucester has been closed and the five employees given other jobs. Only two trains a day stop in the town and locals claim the service as it stands isn't good enough. Coming out of the station at um, 5.20 to catch the 5.24 to Sydney, Two hours later the train hasn't turned up because it's been held up somewhere. No phones on the station, no way of leaving the station in case the train does pull in to go and check to see where it is. So they just have to wait here and, until it comes. Other things, elderly people, we've had cases of blind people getting onto a train and actually half on the train when it started to take off. Graham Holstein has been leading the fight against the closure. According to these state rail figures compiled by him, the station would be far more profitable if one person was employed to oversee its management, sell tickets and take care of parcels. But the state government refuses to employ anyone. As well as the inconvenience of a downgraded service, Mr Holstein believes Gloucester's tourist trade is also suffering. We have a, a good tourist industry. We're losing on the tourist industry. Um, and that's a, that's a major factor. Um, we have people who no longer even come to Gloucester for their annual holidays simply because the SRA will no longer allow them to book a seat on a train um, closer than one month to the departure of the train. Gloucester, though, is not alone in its struggle to have the station reopened. Both Dungog and Wingham also want a better service. Jodie McKay for MBN News. Maps outlining the proposed boundary changes were first released publicly last Friday. One of the most serious anomalies concerns the division between the Swansea and Charlestown electorates. Take for example the suburb of Dudley. Residents on the northern side of one street would belong to Charlestown. Those on the southern side of the street would belong to Swansea, a neighbourhood divided by a line on the map. And the beachside suburb of Redhead, historically included in the Charlestown electorate, is to join the seat of Swansea. For MP Richard Face, who held the seat of Charlestown at the last election for the ALP by just over 60 votes, this change could make the seat impossible to retain. The ALP is to appeal the exclusion, a case it's won twice before when similar changes were put forward by the Electoral Commission. Member for Swansea Ivan Welsh believes the boundary change is politically motivated. It doesn't make any sense either logically, geographically or uh, uh, demographically whether we have uh, Redhead and Dudley or uh, the Elabano uh, Valentine side. And I think that's either been done uh, as a snipe at Richard Face or as a uh, blatantly political move. The Hunter's other independent, George Keegan, faces changes to the seat of Newcastle. Stockton will now be included in his seat and not Port Stephens. While he may feel the heat of an ALP backlash from that suburb, he says the residents there have been used as pawns to prop up the marginal seat of Port Stephens for too long and rightfully belong back in Newcastle. It's been acknowledged that there's a strong Labor uh, area in a, as a suburb and uh, they've been taken for granted and placed in a position where their votes are only be used just for political power. There's been no thought about giving them service back for those votes. Beachgoers alerted an inflatable rescue boat after seeing two youths waving from rocks a few hundred metres offshore. The teenagers had failed to heed beach clothes signs, spending the morning spearfishing among rocks south of Nobbies. At about midday they attempted to return to shore, only to encounter a strong current. After futile attempts to swim in, they called for help. Once ashore, 14-year-old Fran Chamel of Islington and 15-year-old friend Chris Henson of Canberra received a stern lecture from a beach inspector. However, they were complimented on staying calm and not getting into worse trouble by exhausting themselves swimming against the current. Beach inspector Ian Gordon says the youths could have found themselves in serious danger. And they didn't check with the lifesavers and the conditions. Um, at the moment Nobbies is closed. We have a large school of sharks with one big one in there, a professional fishing boat reported to us. 
and we're just waiting on confirmation from the Westpac chopper that the sharks have moved on. So yes, they did pick a bad day. Drinkers at the Central Coast's Kincumber Hotel could be forgiven for wondering exactly what was in their brew. Two larger-than-life ladies were in town, keen to celebrate a birthday with some cake and a few not-so-quiet beers. I noticed you didn't ask them for any sort of proof of age then. Oh, Bruce, by the looks of their skin, I'm sure they're old enough. In fact, Bambi, the more petite of the two Indian elephants, turned 30 today, and the people from the Perry Brothers Circus thought it only fitting to help her celebrate. Dangerous to go drinking with an elephant at all? Well, not really, not unless you get into a shout with them, then you're in real trouble. And with a combined body weight of seven tonnes, we're assured a few medicinal buckets of beer won't be enough to put them over the limit come showtime. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. From outside, the Connemara Crescent home shows little damage. The residents were too distressed to talk about last night's ordeal when they came home at about 1am to find the house engulfed in smoke. The parents woke their teenage children who fled to safety, but their elderly father, William Isaac Johnson, was trapped. Firefighters believe the blaze started in his room. Apparently a, a mattress caught a fire from a short circuit on the uh, clock radio. The elderly man was quickly overcome by smoke from his burning mattress despite efforts by the family to reach him with a garden hose. Mr Johnson was also disabled, giving him little chance of escape. He apparently, the gentleman, he got out of bed because he was in his wheel wheelchair stuck behind the, the door. And so he had made some sort of attempt? To get out of the room, yes. He couldn't, he was practically blind I believe. The long haul to world champion status has finally paid off for Sharon with an excellent effort to capture the title at Henley Beach in Adelaide last weekend. Today at Belmont, Sharon reflected on the last 12 months. I, I came third last year so I was really hoping to do well but I, I wasn't too sure. I, I, you know, the competition was a lot harder this year so I'm, re I'm really pleased. But with every milestone you reach, another one appears and a step up in class to achieve her new ambition of reaching Barcelona is just around the corner. I want to try um, in the Olympic class, start sailing Division 2 boards and head back over to Europe and try and get some experience over there and see what happens from there. And the road to Spain starts in Brisbane on the weekend. We're off to um, Brisbane on next Thursday for our pre-Olympic trials. Um, it's not a, a really major regatta but um, the, next, the most important thing is our Australian titles which are on in April this year so from now on I guess I'll just be training for those. The hospital owes its existence to a benevolent society established in 1885. By 1896, after donations from the Arnott's family, the Western Suburbs Hospital was built on land donated by the state government in Waratah. Since then, some 100,000 Novocastrians have been born at the hospital. Some families have an association that crosses three generations. Today, there are nearly 70 obstetric and gynaecological beds, but all this will be absorbed into the new John Hunter Hospital. For matron Shirley Moxie, it represents the end of a career at Western Suburbs that began in 1966. We have been fortunate in the fact that we have been relatively small and have been therefore able to easily maintain that intimacy that has accompanied the service here over the years. The Western Suburbs Hospital in recent years has become the low-risk maternity unit. Its nursery is the focal point for activity. Mothers there are not encouraged to keep their babies with them in the ward around the clock. Newcastle's other major maternity and paediatric unit is here at the Mater Hospital at Waratah. 
it too will go to John Hunter in February. Combining the protocol and procedures of the western suburbs with the Mata Hospital is bound to provide a myriad of challenges for both the administrators and the staff. For one, the Mata promotes mother and baby together in the same room. And when it comes to terminations, the Catholic members of staff transferred from the Mata may have difficulty with the public hospital protocol, which allows terminations when medically justified. At John Hunter, they'll be allowed to excuse themselves from duty in such cases. One thing's for sure, the new birthing rooms and baby wards at John Hunter are first class, with modern facilities and 24 private rooms. So really it has been a hospital that the community has great input to the design of, so I think that's one of its very good features. In the days since the death of Trinity Parker, questions have been raised about why a 14-year-old girl was held in police cells. A submission by an ALP branch last year suggests that Trinity's case was not the first time a juvenile was held in police custody for an extended length of time. This particular complaint in August uh, indicated that it had been going on, not at odd times, it had been going on reasonably consistently. In August 1990, Mr Face alerted the State Attorney-General John Dowd to the problem and asked that the situation be investigated. Ironically, he did not receive a reply until Tuesday, one day after Trinity Parker's death. That reply came from the Minister for Police and Community Services, Ted Pickering. It outlined the procedures for the holding of juveniles in custody. It said that if a child offender is detained in a police cell, steps are taken to ensure his or her welfare. That includes frequent checks of the cell and the constant monitoring of the offender's physical and emotional condition. It continues, in the event that confinement appears to be having an effect on the child, immediate steps are taken to provide medical attention or transfer the offender to a detention centre. I'd hope for everybody's sake that uh, those were followed uh, to the T because he's got himself on public record as saying this is what done and what should be done and uh, if that had been done I'd be reasonably confident that maybe the tragedy wouldn't have occurred. Well, as you can see, the South Stain is just docking in Newcastle now. Uh, it's running a few hours late after a slow departure from Sydney. However, that hasn't dampened the enthusiasm of hundreds of people who've lined the harbour here to watch it arrive. And Newcastle turned on a suitably maritime welcome to this grand old lady of steam, providing a flotilla of smaller craft to escort the vessel into the port. But it's only here beside the dock that they can get an idea of the quite uh, magnificent proportions of this vessel. The twin funnels are about the same height as a four-storey building. Uh, when when it comes to the interior we believe that's quite lavish however at this stage the owners say they're not letting anyone on board they want to clean it up after it's quite a long voyage from Melbourne to Newcastle they say however they will open it for uh, an inspection on Sunday and they believe they'll be up and running as a restaurant uh, within about a month's time Tracy Mums, dads, brothers, sisters, wives and girlfriends bade farewell to the rugby players at around 11 o'clock this morning. Their destination, California, where they will meet the Griffins Belmont Shores Rugby Club on Sunday, USA time. From there, the team will play in Texas before heading to England, where they will play three matches, including one against our sister city, Newcastle on Tyne. Then further matches in Wales, Scotland and one in Hawaii on the way home. For coach Mick Willis, the venture will benefit Newcastle rugby in general situation where we've got a, a good bulk of experienced players, good campaigners that have been away and there are a lot of uh, younger guys who are on the verge of going not only Newcastle selection but uh, country and then uh, New South Wales sort of particularly in the 1921 area as well and it'll give them a, a very good start and a good grounding for them. While for many rugby will be of prime importance, for Jenny and George Tantevsky it's one hell of a way to spend the second half of your honeymoon. 
On Belmont Bay, the final heat of the Vaucluse Sailors or VS National Championships were sailed in good conditions. VSs have been around since 1936 and since then the 15-foot skiffs have gone through some radical changes, the latest being bigger mainsails to complement the bigger spinnakers brought in recently. Going into today's race, Yandu, skippered by John Winning, and Winning Isn't Everything, skippered by Ian Goodbury, were equal on points. Yandu got a flying start, and although going on a different tack to most, rounded the first mark a clear leader, and with Spinnaker flying, increased his lead by Boyd too. Winning Isn't Everything was trying hard to bridge the gap, but Yandu was in full flight and maintained his lead to beat Winning Isn't Everything into second place. Chemist Shop was third. Representatives from each state and from New Zealand took part in the opening ceremony at the basketball stadium this morning with Newcastle's Lord Mayor John McNaughton officially launching the tournament. First stage in 1973, the Veterans Championship of Australasia is now one of the fastest growing tournaments in the country and there is definitely no room for hit and giggle anymore. It's a very, very severe competition and the hit and giggle business went out and put the arc. <laughs> now it's, it's um, a high standard of competition and uh, the veterans really enjoy their tennis and they want to win. The first week is a team competition with the Kiwis the defending champions. New South Wales ran second at the last carnival in Wellington and will be keen to go one better at home. Next week is the individual events and players of the calibre of Mal Anderson and Leslie Barry will take part. And for players such as 89 year old Bernie Donoghue there is a secret as to how he keeps going. Oh, well I joke about it, I reckon it's plenty of whiskey and no sex. But along with the seriousness of the tennis, there is the lighter side. I can relax and enjoy a terrific week with the friends and people my own age group and be back into competition again. We come from Perth, Western Australia. We travel a long way. We went to New Zealand and all sorts. We really get to know Australia and all Australian. Well, we are a very competitive uh, country, New Zealand, and we're really looking forward to mixing with the Australians. They came and asked you to Wellington. We enjoyed their company. Most certainly the most enjoyable tennis to play today. Uh, there's no bad line calls. Everyone's having fun. It's enjoyable. And uh, yes, it's uh, certainly better than any other tennis that I'm playing at the moment. The newly formed Newcastle branch of the Caduceus Club hosted the luncheon for the Maitland Harness Racing Club and talk moved from the unbelievable weather at the Paceway last Saturday evening to who's going to win the big one, the 30th Maitland Intercity Pace this Saturday night. It's a race steeped in history. It's a great race, uh, Mike. Uh, one of the great country races in New South Wales. We're very proud to be part of it here at the Caduceus Club. Race caller Ned Wilshire had an eventful night on Saturday in heat four of the inner city pace, realising with some prompting that they still had 600 to go. Just one of those lapses, those things happen. It shows though that the people are listening, doesn't it? What about Saturday night? Who's your tip for Saturday night? Saturday night, I've got to go for Scott Michael. He run, won his heat when the track was heavy, seven seconds slower than Yankee Elmenhurst. He boxed it, boxed it on the rail, three horses on the outside. He couldn't get out to the last bit, came home very strong, and I think he'll win the final. The barrier draw was kind to the early favourite, Yankee Almahurst, who will start off the front line. But Scott Michael and Adios River will have to come from the second row if they are to make an impact. Scott Michael is a very, very smart horse. He'll be driven by Keith Pike. It's two to one in the early market. Yankee Almahurst is the favourite at five to four. He's a three-year-old, only three or four three-year-olds have won the race. But this horse is well above average. He won the Bathurst Starby a couple of starts back and he'll shake the life out of the race. Police and representatives of the heavy transport industry were together again today to hand over the first tangible sign of their new spirit of cooperation. 
Have a Chat was conducted in December in an attempt to foster better understanding between police and truckies and diffuse their head-on confrontations on the highways. The word is spreading. It's very difficult on the road uh, for both sides to do their job and I think perhaps uh, just to talk to each other on a more agreeable basis uh, was helpful. The Angel One Rescue Helicopter Appeal benefited from donations of more than $1,500. The $2 million aircraft relies on public support to keep it flying. Since it went into service in July, the chopper has flown 300 missions. If we don't have uh, ongoing support from groups such as this, we, uh, we simply can't operate. So it's very, very important to us to receive that ongoing funding. D-Day in the Hunter region began early with post office employees sifting through the region's 4,000 HSC results. Although relegated to the floor of the Newcastle post office, the contents of these envelopes could either launch or sink a career. After almost two months of waiting, the suspense for some was almost unbearable, while others wished the moment had never come. <laughs> but with the tear of the envelope, there was no turning back. As in previous years, the Hunter figured well at the state level with 23 students in the top 1%, equal first in the region with a tertiary entrance ranking of 99.95%, with Sophia Thompson of St Clair's in Taree and Jason Kimberley of Warners Bay High. It was about the same as I expected, they were a little bit higher. This is the first year the percentile ranking has been used and it has caused some confusion. The Department of Education has set up six inquiry centres to handle students and parents' queries. HSE Inquiry Centre, Trevor Swan. The offices will be opened until the end of the week, but comparisons with previous years can be worked out by reading the University Admissions Handbook. A ranking of 80 at the moment uh, would be equivalent to a score of about 345 in the past. With the demise of Carrington Slipways just before Christmas, the Ards workforce could be forgiven for lacking motivation. Most lost a week's pay over the Christmas break and the yard must generate its own cash to pay out annual leave and long service entitlements. Despite the bleak and uncertain future, the momentum has been retained. Last Friday and Saturday, more than 120 tonnes of steel were erected on the ship. That's a record performance for this yard and a level of output matched only by some Asian shipbuilders. We haven't put up two units in two days in this shipyard uh, for I don't know how long, if ever. And under the circumstances, I'm uh, very proud of our people here. 100 people worked over the two days to erect the superstructure, which will house the ship's bridge and accommodation. The top section was being craned into place for a measure only, but the fit was so good, it was left in place. Keith Lynch, who was previously the general manager of Carrington Slipways, now works with A&L, and has high praise for the cooperative manner in which the many difficulties have been resolved. And these people are good, solid Newcastle people. Uh, they've hopped in and they've got the job done and haven't dwelt too long on some of those most difficult things that they've been experiencing. The days of coaches and parents bellowing from the sidelines of junior soccer games may soon be a thing of the past. The popularity of the sport has been waning with youngsters, but now it seems methods have turned full circle. Hopefully these courses will reinforce to the lads that they can enjoy the game by fun learning. 
Ken Kaiser, who has been running clinics for a decade, sees them as a valuable investment in the sport. 70 young players from Newcastle and country areas are taking part with National League and Australian representative coaches such as Joe Senkalsi. The clinic identifies players who might continue their training at the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra. Tony Bashford of Holmesville is after a place in the Australian Women's World Cup team. She's also the only girl on the paddock. Even though you're the only girl here, you know, if you come to learn, you know, well, you've got to break in somehow. Along with the juniors, a group of coaches are also learning a new approach to the game. They've soldiered through a week of written and practical tests for their Level 2 accreditation. Well, to coach kids in youth development is probably one of the best experiences you'll ever have. 